Well, uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to this, the uh, third meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2024. Uh, the first item uh, for consideration by members of the committee is whether or not to take agenda items three and four in private this morning. Uh, are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, thank you very much. And the substantive item on our agenda this morning is consideration of a Section 22 report uh, into the 2022-23 audit of NHS uh, Forth Valley. So can I welcome uh, the four witnesses that we've got um, with us this morning? Uh, Stephen Boyle, the Auditor General, very welcome. Uh, and this morning the Auditor General is joined by Pat Kenny, who's uh, an Associate Partner uh, Audit and Assurance at Deloitte, uh, and Rebecca McConaughey, uh, who is a Senior Manager uh, at Deloitte. Uh, and uh, we're also joined uh, by Lee Johnson, who's a Senior Manager at Audit Scotland. Uh, we've got uh, a number of questions to put to you based on the report uh, that was uh, produced into uh, the performance of NHS Forth Valley. But before we get to those, Auditor General, can I invite you to give us a short opening statement? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Committee. Convener, I'm bringing this report uh, to highlight matters of public interest in NHS Forth Valley that I've prepared under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000. The external auditor issued an unmodified audit opinion on NHS Forth Valley's 2022-23 financial statements. They also highlight that the board met its financial targets in 2022-23, achieving a small surplus of £229,000. They go on to report that the board needs to make £40.6 million of savings in the 2023-24 financial year. Financial challenges, however, are not unique to NHS Forth Valley and to varying degrees are being felt by NHS boards across Scotland. We'll be reporting to the committee um, in a few weeks on our NHS overview report, which will go into this in more detail. My report today highlights concerns raised by a range of review bodies during 22-23 in relation to the governance, leadership and culture of NHS Forth Valley and the subsequent progress that the board is making to address these issues. On the 23rd of November 2022, NHS Forth Valley was escalated to stage four of the NHS Scotland performance escalation framework due to those concerns about governance, leadership and culture. Concerns had been raised firstly by Healthcare Improvement Scotland in relation to patient safety at Forth Valley Royal Hospital. Then, the National Planning and Performance Oversight Group on a range of performance-related issues in respect of GP and primary care out-of-hours services, unscheduled care, mental health services and progress on integration. In January 2023, NHS Education for Scotland further reported concerns about clinical supervision arrangements. Stage 4 escalation brings direct formal oversight and coordinated engagement from the Scottish Government in the form of an assurance board. An escalation improvement plan was developed by NHS Forth Valley and agreed by its board in December 2022 with the aim of strengthening its leadership, supported by effective governance and improving its culture. A HIS action plan is also in place to address the requirements arising from its unannounced safe delivery of care inspections. Regular monitoring and updates have been provided on the actions in both plans. The mid-year review by the Scottish Government reported to the Board in May of last year that they confirmed that they had received assurance that the Board's leadership remained committed to delivering the required change. It also highlighted, though, the importance of achieving changes within the time frame set out in the Escalation Improvement Plan and keeping staff, local people and their elected representatives informed of progress. The Chief Executive announced her intention to retire from the Board in September of last year and an interim Chief Executive is in place. The Board will soon be recruiting for a permanent replacement. NHS Fort Valley is responding positively to the escalation framework. It has put appropriate governance arrangements in place and has made progress in the months since agreeing the Escalation Improvement Plan. It's critical, though, that sustained progress is made, especially under the new leadership, with sufficient resources 
put in place to drive forward the changes that are required. Convener, as you've mentioned, I'm joined by colleagues from Deloitte and from Audit Scotland, and we look forward to answering the committee's questions. Uh, Auditor General, thank you very much indeed. Well, we're going to go straight away uh, to those questions, and uh, for the first uh, series of questions, I'm going to invite the Deputy Convener, Sharon Dowie, to put them. Sharon. Thank you. Good morning. Um, page 4, paragraph 4 in the summary. This report highlights concerns raised by a range of review bodies in 2022-23 in relation to the governance, leadership and culture of NHS Fort Valley and the progress the Board is making in addressing these issues. Can you give us more detail on the nature of the concerns? Yeah, good morning, Deputy Convener. We can, um, and perhaps just highlight to the Committee's attention Exhibit 1 from the Section 22 report which sets out a timeline of events um, tracking from April 2022 through to January 2023, um, arising from a range of um, independent external bodies who uh, uh, apply regulation and inspection processes on NHS. I'll bring Lee in a minute, actually, just to kind of say a, a bit more detail on some of the, the nature of the work of the inspection bodies. But perhaps just to, to kick off, right at the, the start of that timeline, we draw attention to the work of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, who uh, in, inspected um, quality of care in an unannounced visit. As part of their arrangements, um, they will arrive at a health facility to form an assessment of how well patient care has been delivered, how safely it's been done, and engage with staff on their views and so forth. That inspection report um, raised concerns about the quality of care um, on a couple of examples. So they found that in respect of a patient's ability to consent to care, a lack of documentation and risk assessments in respect of an adult with uh, incapacity. They then also highlighted concerns about the capacity and uh, use of an extra bed within a ward facility within Fort Valley Royal Hospital. They went on to say, Deputy Convener, about the frustrations that staff who are engaged with the inspectors conveyed about the extent to which they were being listened to and supported by management. Um, as his regularly do, where they have found concerns, they will then follow up that quickly and they carried out a further inspection later that month in April 2022 and found that the concerns that they had raised a couple of weeks previously hadn't been addressed. And that brought about a report and escalation arrangements. I can go on, Deputy Convener, but, but I can convey in my introductory remarks. These were then uh, followed up by uh, further matters identified by the Scottish Government's National Planning Performance Oversight Group about arrangements for unscheduled care progress in meeting um, out-of-hours services, the four-hour wait time within A&E, mental health services, progress on integration and aspects of governance, leadership and culture. So there are a range of issues, Deputy Convener, that uh, have been highlighted by inspection bodies, accepted by the board, associated action plans and the need for progress that drew uh, my judgment for today's report that this was worthy of public comment and scrutiny uh, through a Section 22 report. I'll pause for a moment and, and again happy to broaden out discussion to colleagues who, who wish to uh, support further. Uh, I, I guess I don't have much to add um, to what the Auditor General has already said. I think in terms of some of the service performance, uh, um, obviously accident and emergency within NHS Fourth Valley um, and the meeting, the four hour waiting time uh, target um, performance has been poor um, for an extended period of time now um, alongside ch access to children um, and adolescent mental health services. Again, NHS Fourth Valley uh, was one of the poorest performing um, NHS boards um, in Scotland. 
Um, the only other thing that I would raise was um, some of the concerns raised by NHS Education Scotland around clinical supervision um, and basically a lack of consultant oversight of doctors in training. Um, and uh, doctors in training, I think, being expected to work beyond their competence. Um, and obviously, NHS Education for Scotland will be monitoring that um, and looking for some improvement there. OK, thank you. Um, I know some of my colleagues will come back in with other questions in governance uh, later on. Um, again, Section 5, 2022-23, NHS Growth Valley delivered a break-even position achieving an underspend of 229,000 against its revenue resource limit. However, the board experienced significant financial challenges during the course of the year due to ongoing capacity and staffing pressures, increases in medicine costs, ongoing COVID-19 legacy expenditure and delays in delivering recurring savings plans. Um, can you tell us, um, do you know why there have been delays in delivering the recurring savings plans? Um, I'll invite colleagues from Deloitte um, to update the committee on really, I guess, the, the extent of financial progress that was made to deliver a break-even position. And I think I, I appreciate the committee uh, well cited in this, but perhaps worth stating for the record that NHS boards are required to break even every single year in terms of their revenue and capital uh, position. <coughs> so they have to deliver... Um, programme of activity within the financial limits set by the Scottish Government. Um, paragraph 17, I think, which you uh, refer to, Deputy Convener, notes that there are a wide range of financial challenges facing NHS boards, and uh, I think reasonably mentioned in opening remarks is that these are not unique to NHS Fourth Valley. Every year, NHS boards start with a requirement to and deliver savings programmes to support the efficient, effective use of public money while delivering their services and meeting their financial targets. It's been a common feature, and, and Pat can, and Rebecca can say more about this, that um, in order to um, move to a more sustainable position, there's an expectation that boards will deliver recurring savings, so an element of transformation. So rather than either opportunistic or one-off style of savings, known as non-recurring, actually move to a way that the uh, service is delivered in a way that is financially sustainable whilst achieving operational ambitions. What we've seen in Fourth Valley and elsewhere is that there is an ongoing reliance on non-recurring savings. So you might get the target that in that year in question, but you'll be back to square one effectively for the following year. I'll pause for a, for a moment or two and actually invite Pat just to set out for the committee, I suppose, some of the nature of the non-recurring savings and what steps the board is taking to look at some of that more transformational activity that will be recurring in nature. Pat. Uh, thanks, Auditor-General. Rebecca's actually got that detail, so I'll pass that work one on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the recurring or the non-recurring savings in 2022-23 were approximately 60% of the total savings programme. Four Valley did achieve the full savings programme that they required in 2023, but there is still an issue with um, the majority of savings coming from a non-recurring basis. They expect in 23-24 to again have 60% of savings on a non-recurring basis. While they are working towards you know, more recurring savings on a transformation transformational change basis um, in line with other boards um, in the sector, they are still uh, reliant on a heavy amount of um, non-recurring savings at the moment. So is there a lack of pace? Like every business needs transformation to basically keep it viable. So, And you mentioned earlier on about lack of communication with staff as well. So is there a lack of pace with the board and with NHS to to actually transform to make sure that they're going to have these recurring savings? I think we'll certainly be able to speak further with the committee when we publish the NHS overview report to give you a rounded picture of the financial position of NHS Scotland and uh, how savings are progressing in terms of recurring and, and non-recurring um, in the next few weeks. Deputy Convener, but in respect of NHS Fort Valley, um, their financial position um, isn't the isn't the root cause of concern um, as it relates to the operation of, of the board. The, 
just to, to draw that distinction, they weren't escalated by the Scottish Government in respect to the financial position in a way that some health boards have previously uh, been so. But I think but, but nothing's in isolation. So, uh, as Lee's mentioned, NHS Fourth Valley um, performance in respect of A and E CAMS um, and also on aspects of its uh, uh, psychological therapy uh, arrangements are uh, in the lower quartile of performance. So, whilst its financial position is more healthy than other boards, its service performance isn't. What needs to be looked at in the round of how it delivers improvements in its performance whilst managing its financial position. So, you can, so you know, examples in terms of non-recurring savings, you could say well, slippage on developments, slippage on recruitment. And I think that's one of the factors that, that we've seen in, through our audit and through and, uh, Pat and Rebecca's work is that there has been slippage in the recruitment to key posts. So Lee mentioned you know, a lack of clinical oversight. These factors are all connected. So as the board moves to progressing all the actions in its actions plan and addressing the findings of inspectors and regulators, it's reasonable to assume that that will have a bearing on its financial position. So it has going to have to manage all of these factors in the round as it transforms its services and still meets the requirements of the Scottish Government to deliver uh, its financial balance over the years to come. So there's work to be done here, but I think it's pro it is fair to say that the, the nature of the escalation wasn't on the f its financial position for the time being. Um, you mentioned NHS 4 5 will be uh, facing the same challenges that all other NHS boards will be facing across the country. Are there any challenges that are unique to NHS Fourth Valley? And if you could maybe tell us a bit more about them, if there is any. There are, there are certainly there are, there are very clear challenges for NHS Fourth Valley. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll bring um, colleagues from Deloitte in again to say a bit more about the, the financial position. Um, and I know other members will want to come in about the nature of the challenges that um, brought the concerns of regulators were in respect of leadership, governance and culture. So those were the, the key factors that led to the Scottish Government through its escalation framework to bring in enhanced monitoring and supervision of NHS Fourth Valley. These are the factors that they need to address satisfactorily, um, together with the evidence base to show progress, and perhaps uh, speak further to the committee about that, that in addressing these factors will allow it to... Um, give assurance to the Scottish Government, patients within NHS Fourth Valley and the wider public that the board is making the necessary progress. But you see, looking at the, and Pat might want to say a bit more, but we set out paragraph 20, as well some of the range of challenges that are uh, facing NHS Fourth Valley in setting a balanced budget. Um, and it's still got progress to make in 23, 24. You know, we're coming towards the end of January now with the end of the financial year, just over a couple of months away. Um, there is a gap to fill in terms of delivering financial balance. And we know that the Scottish Government is working with Fourth Valley to identify solutions to fill that gap. But I'll pause for what I think Pat might want to say a bit more about that. I think um, the, the key challenge for this uh, specific, specific board, and going back to your point about what are the specific challenges that NHS Fourth Valley faces, I think they were summarised in the recent governance report by the chair of NHS Greater Glasgow that, and in terms of performance, the two main challenges were that the integration model um, hadn't been clearly defined, the business model, in terms of roles, responsibilities. Um, and that the second major challenge was um, um, a lack of a high-performing executive management team. And th those two core root causes um, that that review concluded were the, 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 the main root causes of the governance, leadership and cultural issues that the board had. And I think, obviously, as the Auditor General mentioned, there's, you can, there's a clear linkage between governance, leadership and the financial performance of the board. Um, uh, you know, obviously, they, they go hand in hand. But I think those were the two root causes, the, the integration model not being fully defined and issues with the executive management team. 
Right, thank you. And my last question, we're always talking about sharing uh, best practice. So are there any good practice models that NHS Force Valley can learn from other boards that are facing similar challenges? I think we'll uh, perhaps right to draw attention to the work of um, John Brown, who undertook a governance review uh, in NHS Fourth Valley, referencing the blueprint for effective governance within the NHS. So there's, there are benchmarks, Deputy Convener, that NHS Fourth Valley is being um, tracked against. And again, there's, there is much more to say about this, but um, it gives NHS Fourth Valley the opportunity to say, well, here's the expected standard and here's the, the, the steps that you'll want to take to get to that. Um, somewhat helpfully, I think, you know, uh, Mr Brown's report conclude, uh, contains over 50 recommendations to NHS Fourth Valley on its governance arrangements. Um, progress undoubtedly needs to be made ag against those, but I think as a framework, it provides NHS Fourth Valley with the steps that they need to take so that they are able to assure themselves demonstrate you know, clear, effective scrutiny of the progress that the executive leadership team is making. And also, as Pat rightly says, um, the necessary progress with their partners to deliver a sustainable health and social care integration model. I appreciate that the committee will also be, be cited on this, but um, these are very similar to the findings that Audit Scotland made back in 2018 when we produced a report on health and social care integration that again drew attention to the need for clarity, consistency um, and effective application of health and so social care integration. NHS Fourth Valley has got steps to go against these benchmarks. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think Graeme Simpson wants to come in uh, with a question in this area. Graeme. Um, I'll leave it till later. Okay. I, th I think the question that occurred to me may be covered by others. Okay, that's Thanks. fine. That's fine. Well, well, can I take us back then to um, uh, current financial year performance? And I think Colin Beatty, for example, is going to talk about the deficit issue, which is a, a, a major feature of the report. But if, if we can just look at the current year, you mentioned in the... Um, in the report that there's been an overspend of 3.2 million in acute services, but an underspend of 1.3 in corporate functions and an underspend of 2.245 million in ring-fenced and contingent budgets. Could you um, explain a little bit more the detail that lies behind those figures, please? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll quickly pass to uh, colleagues in, in Deloitte Convener who'll have the detail that underpins what looks like to be a range of over and underspends that lead to uh, a small surplus. I think that's, and th this is always a feature of NHS board financial management at the year end, just to deliver what are ultimately you know, multi-million pound organisations. Um, and a, a, as a feature of public sector accounting, they have to deliver that financial balance. So um, it's not uncommon to see that kind of level of uh, in-year management. But what's this behind it? I'll, again, I'll pass the link to Rebecca just to kind of share that detail with the committee. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, yes, so the, the key things, um, particularly within acute services, relate to contingency bed and temporary staff and arrangements um, that the board has had to put in place. Um, this has obviously been recovered via underspend on corporate functions, which generally... Um, due to you know delays in certain um, projects that they've undertaken on an organisation-wide basis. Um, ring fence and contingent budget was underspend, but that's offset by the delegated functions and operational services. The main concern there is in re relation to prescribing, so increased cost and volume of prescribing um, medicines under that budget. So they were the key things that drove the under and overspends in those different categories. Can I, can I ask about one of those in particular, which is the, um, uh, the spend on uh, agency and, and bank staff? Because um, I think the Auditor General in his opening statement mentioned about uh, elected representatives being briefed by the Health Board, and I speak as one of the elected representatives who's had these briefings. And one of the features of those which I've been uh, trying to interrogate is the extent to which there has been a, a ballooning in spend uh, by um, NHS Fourth Valley on bank and agency staff. I think we had a report back in May of 2023 where it said year on year there was an increase in spend 
in the region of 70, 71%. I think by December of 2023, which was the last briefing I attended, uh, the figure that was being cited was a 46% annual increase in spend on agency and bank. Uh, I mean, could you give us uh, your understanding of the reasons for such a big escalation in costs in that area just on a year-on-year -year basis? Uh, what lies behind that? And do you have any sense of how that compares with the reliance on agency of, and bank of other health boards of a similar size? It's, a, it's such an important factor, convener, and one that um, I guess both through our overview reporting and indeed uh, engagement with this committee and, and previous committees, we, we have discussed about the, the need for sustainability of services. So ultimately, if there are vacancies, and, it, and vacancies arise primarily in nursing, that will be uh, in respect of bank and agency services, um, and the health board has an obligation to respond to that. It usually covers its need for resource where it's not available on its roster through the use of bank and agency. Bank being preferable because it's uh, much more commonly at uh, early rates that are aligned to those of permanent staff. The use of agency, however, always comes at a premium. In terms of the, the specifics, I'll just, I perhaps need to turn to colleagues from Deloitte whether we have any detail that sits behind um, the movement from um, one year to the next. Um, if we don't have that convener, I think it's something that we may need to come back and check our records uh, and come back to the committee on writing whether we have that detail. On a Scotland-wide basis, um, it's something that we are considering really carefully for our reporting of the overall financial position that we'll be setting out in the NHS overview report in the next few weeks. But I'll pause again just to see if there's anything that colleagues can add. I think it's something we may need to come back to you in writing, Camilla. OK, look, that's fine. I mean, um, I don't know whether you're, uh, I'm asking you to break an embargo, but could you give us an early insight into how 70% and 46% uh, compare to the kind of figures you, that you've been unearthing in your preparation of the overall NHS report? It's Lee. very similar across Scotland, and I think you'll see that in our NHS in Scotland report when we bring it to the committee. OK, I thanks. I don't think that that's... Um, specific to NHS Forth Valley. I think that's a similar picture across NHS in Scotland. Right, so it's not a function then, for example, of the level of vacancies, or it's not a function of a particular sickness absence rate in NHS Forth Valley, for example? It's level of vacancies and sickness absence rates across NHS Scotland um, is reflected in the high costs of agency and bank staff across NHS in Scotland. Right, but I guess, sorry, just... <laughs> One of the inferences, I think, is that um, the poor leadership and uh, some of the things that came out of the Healthcare Improvement Scotland report suggest that there might be higher than average levels of absenteeism uh, and that this uh, figure of banking and agency expenditure might be a function of that. But we've been told this morning that's not the case. Can I, you know, I just want to try and clarify that. I, th I think... I'm not sure we'd be able to be as definitive a conclusion that, that these um, aren't related, uh, convener, that um, the report from the inspectors clearly draws attention to the fact that there were staff concerns about not being listened to, about the engagement with senior leadership in the organisation um, and the implications of that for the wider culture of the organisation. There will be many factors, quite sure, that of why a person is unable to go to their work. What's undeniable, though, there, there were very specific concerns over and above the wider factors that affect NHS Scotland and that would lead to somebody not being at their work that NHS Fourth Valley have to address in terms of its leadership and culture. Um, the action plan that accompanies that will have to be delivered so that NHS Fourth Valley, the Scottish Government Insurance Board, can be satisfied that the cultural and leadership issues are not exacerbating wider national challenges that cause people to be off their work. Thanks. Because I think Healthcare Improvement Scotland's uh, initial report did identify an excessive reliance on uh, bank and agency staff as one of the concerns. And I think the, the description they used in that report was they had serious concerns, and that was one of the serious concerns which they had. Um, but I'm going to turn now uh, to Colin Beatty, who's got some uh, more questions to put and maybe an initial observation to make to start us off with. Colin. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, or as a general, before I come to questions, the one thing about this report, from my perspective, is it has a different feel to it than some of the reports that you've produced. And some of the detail that's normally in reports isn't there. I mean, you're, we talk about uh, issues around governance, leadership and culture, and there are some part, some explanation of that, but it doesn't seem to go into the depth that you normally do. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm still sitting here thinking, OK, well, leadership, what, what's happened with leadership? Where, where is that demonstrably failing? You can imply a little bit from some of the things you see, but there's nothing specific. Well, morning, Mr. Mayor. Grateful for, for your observations and your feedback. I think what I would note is that this report is um, slightly different from other Section 22 reports that we produce. I, I recognise that, whereby many of our Section 22 reports, as you know, draw on the work of the external auditor uh, through the annual audit process. Where the kind of most significant departure from this report is that it's drawing not just on the work of the external auditor, but also from a, a wider range of reporting from other external organisations, his, NES uh, and, and others, who have produced their own reports, which set out more detail uh, on the accompaniment of, of the findings that have led them to arrive at those judgments. Um, we can think about this actually for you know for similar style reporting about the extent of detail that we go into in our own section 22 report that perhaps needs to be accompanied with the detail um, of of others um, and it's something we can reflect on mr Beatty, about how accessible all of the associated uh, judgments are uh, alongside what's in many respects a summation through the section 22 report well thank you for that um Obviously, from our point of view, from the point of view of the committee, I'm sure every member simply wants to get a full understanding of what's behind the comments that are being made in detail so that we can make our own judgments. Uh, turning to financial sustainability. Paragraph 19 of the report says that uh, despite the savings of £25 million in 23-24, there's a £15.6 million residual deficit. Can you tell us more about that deficit and what the short and long term impacts will be if it's not addressed properly? Yeah, certainly. And again, I'll, I'll pass to uh, Pat, first of all, who may kind of, uh, share with the committee what we understand to be the most up-to-date up position, recognising that we are now closer to the end of the financial year than we were when we uh, finalised the drafting of this report. Um, I think it is significant Mr. Beattie, you know, so the, the board started the year with the need to make 41, nearly £41 million pounds of savings to ensure financial balance. Through its uh, the work that Forfali and other boards do each year, they identified £25 million pounds of savings, uh, with only 10 of those expected to be uh, recurring, and therefore further work to find £15.6 million pounds of savings. Um, we understand that progress has been made but there's still a way to go um, within the region of uh, £10 million still to be found within the, the final two and a half months of the financial year. That's significant, and I, and I think that you would have to uh, rightly uh, have questions about whether that can effectively be bridged by NHS Fourth Valley on its own um, without a significant uh, impact on its ability to deliver services as planned. We know that NHS Fourth Valley are engaging with the Scottish Government and Pat can say a bit more about what uh, steps are being taken uh, to, to fill that gap and then more widely what happens if they don't. You know, the, the committee will you know, be familiar with some of the support mechanisms that the Scottish Government uh, is able to offer. And indeed, NHS has Fourth. it been ex escalated? So they're in that process. I think, again, I'll, I'll hand to Pat just to, to update you, Mr Beattie, on on where they're at and, and then potentially what comes next. Yes, um, the, the, the latest position with about two and a half months to go, Mr Beattie, as the Auditor General says, is that they're looking at around a £10 million, uh, deficit. The, I spoke to the Finance Director uh, recently and, and he's hoping 
um, that that might come down a bit. So they're in discussions with the, the Scottish Government in terms of how that deficit is um, financed, if you like. Um, there could be imp implications on the revenue programme or on the capital programme, possibly on timing of capital receipts. There's, there's various options that they're uh, at play at the moment. But I think the big issue here um, is the it, there's obviously an underlying deficit in the board's finances, which, if, if not addressed, will just carry on into um, uh, uh, later years. So I think the big challenge for the board, and again, they're not unique in this sense, is that they need the transformational resource and capacity to, if you like, address that structural deficit um, through innovation, through uh, change, um, through new technology, new ways of working, etc. And I think there are challenges at, 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 the, at Fourth Valley in that respect. Um, I understand internal audit did a review there recently on um, the, the transformation resources available to the board and raised some serious challenges um, in that respect. And I think that the key um, consideration was that the, the internal auditors asked the NHS, the board, at NHS Fourth Valley, to satisfy themselves if they had sufficient resources to adequately address the transformational change required. So I think there are definitely question marks uh, for me in that respect. And that, 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 I think, is the key challenge going forward, is the transformational capacity and resource there in place which will address that underlying structural deficit. I mean, in, in the report, you quite clearly talk about the lead-in times needed to bring in these savings and also about the lack of staffing capacity, which is what you touched on just now. Um, how did we get to two and a half months before the end of the financial year and we're still £10 million out? I think I'll maybe, I'll maybe start with this. There's a couple of points to raise. Is that, um, whilst I mentioned earlier, Mr Beattie, the NHS 4 Valley hasn't been escalated for its financial position the way that some boards have, the scale of financial challenge facing the NHS across the piece in Scotland is significant. Now, just as we as we look to set out in paragraph 20 to the report, there are multiple challenges facing NHS Fourth Valley, and for many of those, you could read across to the NHS uh, in Scotland across the piece that they need to address. So, whether it's recruitment challenges, banking agency factors that the conveners mentioned, the need for recurring savings health and social care integration model to be sorted, inflationary pressures that are affecting all individuals and businesses, and then some local factors. So um, NHS Fourth Valley uh, accommodates through you know, health services a significantly higher percentage of Scotland's prison population, for example. So 23% of Scotland's prison population resides in the NHS Fourth Valley service area. So these are all factors that most years, NHS Fourth Valley has been able to keep a lid on. So it's not an escalation category for finance, but it's becoming more challenging to deliver financial balance. And therefore, the second point to make about it is that, as Pat rightly kind of leads us into, transformation has to be at the heart of service delivery to secure effective services and also financial balance. Colleagues might want to elaborate on this, but um, it... it it rung a bell for me when just, uh, reading that um, the committee will recall some of the evidence taking on NHS Highland uh, a couple of years ago. The, the central function of a, a, a programme management office that it brought around as part of its uh, attempts to transform its services, deliver financial balance. We're seeing similar patterns in NHS Fourth Valley. So learning from other places but work to do, Mr Beattie, and say there is, as paragraph 20 sets out, there are many challenges to overcome, and I think there is some doubt, as Pat's mentioned, as to whether it will be able to turn all of this round within the short space of the, the remaining months of this financial year. The issues that Fourth Valley faces is not dissimilar to other NHS boards in terms of uh, the difficulty in identifying recurring cost savings. But they are very high at 
in terms of the 29.3 million in 22-23. I mean, a huge chunk of it, 69%. And that means they've got to identify that again the following year. So what steps are they taking to address that problem? Because they're only rolling up the problem into the future. They're not resolving it. And this is the classic conundrum that uh, health boards need to tackle so that you get to the finish line in financial balance one year with non-recurring savings, but the clock resets for the start of the following year if you do not transform and deliver recurring savings. And that becomes harder and harder, especially when you know setting out, again, in paragraph 20, if I may, just the scale of the range of issues that health boards are facing. And if you can't do that on a um, sustained basis, even for health boards like NHS Fourth Valley that haven't been experiencing financial pressures as significantly as some others, are now in the frame of having a significant risk. It can't be definitive on it yet because there are a number of months to go, but a significant risk of not being able to deliver financial balance uh, in the, the year in question. Transformation, effective partnership, working, deploying technologies, looking at the base funding arrangements, all have to be part of the decision making for NHS Fourth Valley in conjunction with its assurance board and wider discussions with the Scottish Government. There is a 3% recurring savings target required by all NHS boards. Are they addressing this as a separate specific item or is it just part of the the whole in terms of meeting that deficit? I'll bring colleagues in to say, um, Rebecca, I think it's going to cover this one, Mr Beatty, but in terms of NHS Fourth Valley's wider approach to savings and how integrated that is, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, so they look at the 3% Scottish Government target, but essentially the savings requirement that they have will be over and above that amount. They are forecasting uh, approximately in 2024-25 that they will need to reach an 8% uh, saving threshold in terms of the target that they will need to achieve to achieve financial balance in that year. I suppose I have to ask the question, is that achievable? I guess for us to say, um, you know, we cannot say at the moment, the board is going through a, a budgeting process and that is not finalised. So um, at the moment, the, uh, we don't know. But I would suspect, as we've reported in, in the session 22, there is a significant risk to financial balance in the short term and onwards in terms of sustainability. Sounds a bit gloomy. I, I think, it, I mean, Rebecca's right. That it's probably not going to be uh, possible for us as the auditors to say you know, whether they'll be able to get there or not. I think what we can say is that there's significant risks around their ability to do this. And at the risk of repeating myself, that you can get over the line in one year with non-recurring. But it's becoming harder and harder to sustain that position if you are relying upon non-recurring. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't underestimate this because I, I think the to recognise that um, there isn't a lot of flexibility in overall NHS spending. So much of it is demand-led. So whether it's the cost of prescribing, some of which will be within the control of the board, other elements not, staffing cost pressures, demand requirements overall, the board has to take a longer-term view about how it can move over time to a sustainable model. Um, Health and social care integration plays such a fundamental part in that, Mr Beatty. You know, the committee has heard for many years about uh, shifting the balance of care, a preventative approach to uh, the delivery of health and social care services. NHS Fourth Valley isn't as far forward, as, for, you know, as Pat has mentioned, than other boards. John Brown report um, refers to that as well. This is at the heart of moving to healthy populations, sustainable health and social care models and will assist over time in the delivery of savings to support financial balance too. Just something which uh, comes up fairly regular. Is Fourth Valley using vacancies to help address the deficit in you know, managing its vacancies? So I think all health boards do that. So all will be... Um, 
attributing uh, slippage in recruitment or vacancy management arrangements to support the delivery of financial balance. Um, Deloitte may want to say a bit, a bit more, Rebecca, if you've got any further detail on how the quantification of that. But there's, a, there's a, but you know, whilst you might win on one hand of vacancies, you lose on the other, especially if you have to backfill with higher cost bank and agency services, or even worse, perhaps, if you can't back if you can't backfill the vacancy, you might have a financial saving, but to the serious detriment of your service performance and impact upon patient care on the other. Do you have a percentage as to those vacancies? Um, I don't have that to hand. If it's something we can we can check our records, um, it may be. Just a, be interesting to see if it's yeah. in the same ballpark as other organisations. I think it's something we need to check, Mr. Beatty, or, or indeed that the board themselves um, would have more detail on if they uh, have a planning assumption. I think it's what you're suggesting around vacancy management and how that informs their their budget setting. And just one last thing. The, the report refers to the recurring funding gap associated with the implementation of the primary care improvement plan. Uh, you know, if that's not addressed by the Scottish Government, what's the funding gap in monetary terms, and what does the government need to do to address this gap? Again, I think in terms of this is a fact, the factor to, for the health board and the the board to, to discuss. If, I'm not sure we have, unfortunately, the detail of the scale of that gap uh, in our records. And apologies, we can come back to. Would you to be the, able to provide that? Of course, we can come back to the, the committee as part of our uh, as we follow through um, on it. Um, as, as you'll see, it's one of a number of aspects of the financial challenges that they need to address, both to secure financial balance in the current year mm -hmm. and potentially for, for next year too. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. I mean, j just perhaps if, um, if if I could go back to Re Rebecca McConaughey and just check with you. Did you say that um, the NHS Forth Valley would be required to make savings of the order of 28% threshold? Oh, just to clarify, 8%. 8%. 8. Right, OK, thank you. <laughs> that's, right, that's, uh, yes, that's a bit of a relief for uh, my constituents in the... Uh, the Fourth Valley Health Board area. I mean, but but nonetheless, what you are describing is a situation where uh, we're talking about uh, recovery from COVID and the backlog uh, that there is in treatments there. Uh, we're talking about an already existing ageing population. We're talking about a, a climate of probably then rising demand in... Um, uh, and yet the uh, health boards like Fourth Valley are expected to make produce savings of 3% uh, across the board, and in the case of Fourth Valley, as you've described, it's going to be uh, at least twice that amount they've got to come up with. I mean, could, could you maybe um, explain how that works? I mean, it strikes me that that um, may be unsustainable uh, uh, financially and in terms of outcomes. Uh, that was exactly the comment I was going to make, Convener, and, and reiterates judgments that I've made on the NHS in Scotland and the round in previous years about real doubts about its sustainability in terms of the current way of delivering services. So NHS Fourth Valley, as, you know, as you've heard, has to make recurring savings in the current year, more next year, whilst it needs to improve aspects of its performance. So a &E wait times, <coughs> out of our services, mental health services too. I mean, it would, at risk of being really glib, you know, th these are incredibly difficult uh, challenges to pull off you know, and, and squaring off financial balance on one hand and service improvement in the other. And you can see, therefore, it does require transformation within NHS for Fali and the wider model itself so that we can get to a place where there's a, a healthier, sustainable population and with the finances to support it. OK, thank you. Um, I'm now going to invite Willie Coffey to put some questions to you. Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I, I just wanted to ask before I get to more questions, Stephen, uh, there was mention in your report about the, the high prison population in Fourth Valley having an impact on the uh, health board's ability to deliver financial savings. Why, why would that be such a significant impact, the prison population? So, um, interestingly, um, by coincidence, Mr Coffey, we... Uh, 
we'll be briefing the committee next week on uh, a further Section 22 report on the Scottish Prison Service 22-23 audit, which we'll go into some of this uh, in a bit more detail. But at a higher level, the demands of the prison population and ageing prison population you know, bring uh, a call on health service uh, within uh, the NHS. As a, and as I mentioned, um, the scale of it is significant. So 23% of Scotland's prison population um, is within the NHS Fourth Valley area, with Glen Oakle, Stirling and Pullman all residing within Fourth Valley's uh, boundaries. Um, and, that will, and that will vary, but I think as we've seen, and again, I'm very keen to talk to the committee in more detail uh, with, the, with the report, as the nature of the prison population in Scotland is changing, it is ageing, and that is also bringing further demands upon not just the prison service itself, but NHS providers too. The um, responsibility to deliver healthcare services for the prison population falls within that health board rather than being flattened out across Scotland, does it? Yeah, that's correct. And that's one of the factors that NHS Four Valley is identifying as um, is, um, exacerbating the scale of the financial and service challenges that they have. Um, on my own questions about the performance escalation measures and so on, you've, you've mentioned several um, reports and a variety of different recommendations from different people. Um, initially, HIS produced a set of nine requirements in April 22 for the Fourth Valley Royal Hospital. You then see that uh, in that same year, it was followed up again by a further 11 requirements. Could you firstly give us a little flavour of what are these requirements around about and why are they not being actioned, for, you know, are, are they being actioned now? Yeah, I'm going to actually pass to Lee. I think it would be quite helpful for the committee just to kind of... Um, the, the various reports, the associated action plans, how they're being tracked and monitored, and the progress that's being made. Because I think what we've seen, and you know, Exhibit 1 hopefully helps set out some of the timeline of the reporting. But again, even, even since that cut-off date, there have been more reports. We mentioned a couple of already, John Brown's report on governance arrangements and the, uh, the number of recommendations that that's produced too. Maybe Lee can set out... Um, what's been reported, and then the progress that the board itself, together with the Scottish Government, are tracking progress and how they are being assured. Uh, so, following the his inspections, um, uh, an action plan, which was different to the uh, escalation improvement plan, if you like. There was a Healthcare Improvement Scotland action plan, which addressed um, the, the different recommendations that Healthcare Improvement Scotland had made. Um, I think, as the Auditor General's already outlined, there was a range of different areas that uh, his were concerned about in terms of uh, contingency beds, uh, particularly in non-standard areas, um, about the dignity for patients, about um, emergency evacuation procedures in very crowded areas within the hospital, but also a range of different um, cultural um, issues in terms of staff not feeling like there was an appropriate level of staffing, that there was a good, the right mix of skills, um, or that their concerns were being uh, listened to. Um, so obviously, Healthcare Improvement Scotland will have been monitoring um, progress with those different actions. Um, but we know, for example, that there's been uh, new procedures have been put in place to monitor staffing levels um, within the wards at the hospital. Um, there's a lot, there's new um, support, st more support staff um, and leadership um, being put in place on a kind of 24-7 uh, basis to support staff as well. And there are new mechanisms in place as well to encourage both staff and patients to um, raise concerns, to speak up if you like, and um, if, they have, if they have concerns about the, um, you know, their experience or the safety of care. In, in terms of the, the um the 11 requirements and the 9 requirements, the, the 20 requirements have been placed on them. Are you in a position to say if they're making good progress with these now? Have they completed any? Are they still in the middle of this? Where are we in terms of all those specific 20 requirements that his gave them? I'd, I'd need to come back with the specific detail. We know that they have they have made progress um, in some of those areas. Um, and 
obviously Healthcare Improvement Scotland will be monitoring the progress with that, but I would need to come back to you with the specifics of that. Right, okay. Uh, just just when I was listening to the conversation, convener and Auditor General, we've got his reports, we've got the oversight group, we've got Professor Ritchie's review in October 22, we had 12 recommendations there, there's John Brown's report with 50 recommendations, the escalation improvement plan, the measurement framework. Are we awash? Is the health board awash with report on top of report here, do you feel? Is that a factor here? There's a, there's a lot to get through, yeah. Mr Coffey. And um, I, I think it's probably fair to say these are not competing findings. You know, so they are, some of them are quite specific about arrangements within Fort Valley Royal Hospital from, from his, others from the oversight uh, group about, you know, again, specific service delivery arrangements, whether it's out of hours or unscheduled care. Um, and then the kind of wider uh, Brown report about governance arrangements. Um, there are a lot of recommendations. What Forth Valley has sought to do, and again still uh, making progress or work to do on, is having the right measurement framework in place that sets out very clearly what the recommendation is, what steps have been taken, and that there's then there's governance and scrutiny of that through the assurance, Scottish Government Assurance Board that says, have they done what they needed to do? I think that bit is still work in progress, that they have can satisfy the Assurance Board of the Scottish Government and their own committees and board and, and the Health Board that they are taking all the necessary steps. I, I, I accept the principle of the point you're making, though, actually, is that there's a risk that you can't see the wood for the trees because there are so many recommendations and reports. So that, but it's maybe just an, an illustration here that uh, because there are there is so much interest in getting this health board to a place that it's sustainable and delivering safe and effective patient care, that there's that there is going to be interest and work to get through. Um, the board and the government through this escalation process. So I've just got to be finally satisfied that the steps have been taken and they can effectively score those recommendations off and move on to a sustainable platform. Um, for, for many years, sort of General, you and, and your predecessors have talked about service redesign and transformation, and here we are talking about it again. Do you get the sense that the recommendations that are made in this, on this board are about service redesign and transformation. Is it understood by the health boards? Are they able to deliver that service redesign and transformation that we're talking about here? Are you, are you in a position where you're even confident that they're making progress on that journey? So there's a range of recommendations, I think we've, as we've talked about. Some of these will be very detailed and specific to a, a particular aspect of healthcare within a hospital setting, and others are much more wide-ranging, you know, whether it's governance or culture. You know, culture, for example, is a, is a, um, takes a lot of effort to sustain and even more effort to transform. If just to spend a moment on that, for example. You know, so, again, referencing NHS Highland, again, the committee will be familiar in recent years of some of the cultural challenges that that health board faced went on for um, a number of years and has taken the uh, time to move on to an even keel with you know, a reconciliation process. And there are references in the report that NHS Fourth Valley is thinking along those terms. So that's a, an aspect of resetting um, rather than redesign. The redesign element of it, Mr Brown's report has rightly picked up on in terms of health and social care integration. This is designed to be the redesign transformation component of how healthcare will be delivered in Scotland. That NHS Four Valley is further behind its uh, peers. There's a clear signal that there's work to do to transform that aspect of service. So I think you've really got a, a spectrum of, of, of issues here, Mr Coffey, that some will be about just getting back to where they needed to be. Others, in terms of out of hours, um, is a, perhaps in the middle. So uh, up until the report, out of hours service was run by the acute service provision within NHS Fourth Valley. Again, quite at odds with what you see elsewhere, that typically an out of hours service would be run by um, GPs, primary care practitioners. 
NHS 4 Valley has now moved to that model. So some might say that's just, well, a step. Others say, well, that's transformative. And then you've got the wider pieces at the end of the scale of um, transforming culture and health and social care integration. So a pretty wide range, but most importantly is that the board and the assurance uh, through the Scottish Government have to have that clear oversight that progress has been made on all these fronts. Thank you for that. And uh, I presume it's still at stage four that hasn't changed, has it? No, there's, you're right. There's still uh, The board has still escalated to stage four yeah. of the escalation framework. And, um, and, and I think this, you know, there's um, a bit of matter really for government to be satisfied of when that will, they will uh, move to be de-escalated. Yeah, and you're, you also say that to uh, an independent review of the board and the assurance committee arrangements, it was due to the report was due to be considered by the health board in last November. Have you reviewed any? Have you had sight of that report? And what are its what are its recommendations and conclusions? Yeah, Pat, I think it's going to cover that. Yeah, that, that, that's the report by the, the chair of the NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, um, on, on the governance um, review, and, and he made um, 51 recommendations, which we referred to earlier, 46 of which are still outstanding, and they have been incorporated into the, in the escalation improvement plan. Um, and there's a clear measurement framework in place in terms of KPIs, outcomes to deliver, evidence, etc. And we will look at that as part of this year's audit in terms of how they're delivering against that in terms of progress made. Yeah. I mean, November, was it a bit late in the day coming to arrive at the governance issues? Because it's usually the first port of call for the committee and the members over the years. That, that seems to be the starting point from, for a lot of these issues. How come we got so late to the table? The, the NHS Four Valley Board commissioned the report once they were put in the escalation framework, they wanted an external view. So they, ha they have to be commended for that in terms of um, they reached out and uh, commissioned the review, agreed the terms of reference. It was a wee bit late in terms of delivering the final report. We were expecting it a, um, a, a bit earlier than that. But they, they have taken it on. And as I say, the, the recommendations have been captured in the improvement plan overall. OK. Just offer a thought on that, Mr Coffey. I think, I think Pat's right that... We might have reasonably expected this to have been commissioned at an earlier stage, given how central governance together with leadership and culture were to the basis of the original findings. And that's perhaps uh, supported by the volume of recommendations that Mr Brown has made. You know, so over 50 recommendations on the need to improve governance within NHS Fourth Valley. And, and there's undoubtedly some mitigations to this, and as, as we reported in previous NHS overview reports, that NHS Scotland um, deployed during the pandemic a governance light model that to focus on uh, patient care, safe protection of population and staff during the pandemic. But I think it's probably also true to say that uh, whether that model was switched back to the more traditional governance settings early enough as we came out of the pandemic um, is a question for NHS Fourth Valley. And then again, the timing of, of this review suggests that the pace and centrality of effective governance wasn't quite where it needed to be, given this, as it's probably borne out by Mr Brown's report, the scale of recommendations that we've made. We need to see progress against these now. Well, I was just finally going to ask that convener about the part. I think you said 47 out of 51 of the in uh, action yet? Is it reasonable to ask when we could expect the board to get through that? That's a huge number of recommendations on, on governance issues. So what could we look at six months, a year, or whatever what we're talking about? Certainly, uh, when we conduct this year's audit as part of our wider scope work, we will be looking at the progress. And you know, and I'll be asking myself the question, are they making reasonable progress? Is the pace, is the pace good enough, sufficient enough? It will take them a bit of time, though, I think, to get through. Um, the scale of the recommendations. Some of the recommendations are very wide-ranging. Cultural recommendations, leadership um, recommendations, total, total review. One of the major recommendations is a complete review of the integration schemes, um, which, again, I think will take a bit of time. But, as I say, we will assess progress during this year's audit and report back. OK. And just, again, so just to briefly uh, add to that, Mr Coffey, is we, there's also been some change in the the board of NHS Fourth Valley that has 
um, looking at Mr Brown's recommendations and finding, giving more confidence and assurance to him that the effective governance is in place to address the recommendations and support the wider st stabilisation and change that's required in the health board. Okay. Thanks very much for those responses. Thank you. Can you hear Okay, thank you. And, and picking up on uh, some of those themes that were developing there, uh, Graeme Simpson's got some questions around uh, the Assurance Board leadership and culture. Graeme. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I'm just, I was just looking at the timeline that, that you produced in Exhibit 1, um, and that starts in April 2022 with this visit by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. So do you think that was the first that anyone knew that there were problems in, in this health board? Or would there have been issues raised before that that might have spurred um, HIS to pay their visit? In terms of the motivations for his to carry out their uh, unannounced visit to uh, Fort Valley Royal Hospital, I, I don't have a clear view on that, Mr Simpson, as to... Um, I think it's, it's fair to recognise that healthcare regulators and inspectors exist for a reason, and you know to provide assurance to population elected representatives, to the to the boards of health boards um, of effective patient care. Um, as to whether you know, they had a model that was uh, rag rated, risk rated, or to lead them to Fourth Valley Royal Hospital. I'm not cited on the individual motivations. I think we can probably take some assurance that, that these organisations, together with the oversight that the Scottish Government employs, the engagement that regulators and inspectors routinely have with one another, that the model uh, is working. And if they need to escalate, they did. So Healthcare in Scotland, Healthcare Improvement Scotland carried out their work, weren't satisfied, and they escalated. That feels like a process that was working as intended. Yeah, I mean, obviously they've gone in. They found they found um, quite serious problems there. Um, it just struck me that if there were these serious problems, why didn't we know about it? Why did it take a spot check to to discover them? I think that's a, I mean, it's a bit a really interesting question because there are meant to be a range of avenues for members of staff, patients, to raise concerns. Um, and I th as, as we see, and just kind of as we summarise in our own report some of the, his findings, particularly focusing on staff concerns about not being listened to, as to whether or not you know, some of the well-established arrangements were they working um, as intended? You know, so um, I don't, and I wouldn't want to infer aspects that don't exist. So perhaps separate from this example, but. We know that there are well-established whistleblowing arrangements within the NHS, whistleblowing champions and so on, to give members of staff the opportunity to highlight concerns if they need to. Um, as has clearly set out, something wasn't quite right, that staff felt that they weren't being listened to yeah. by the leadership. And that, I think, is also to some extent reassuring, though, that rather than focusing just solely on individual arrangements to get right within the hospital itself, has have drawn a much wider conclusion that says there are aspects to be addressed in terms of governance, leadership and culture within the board that don't just focus on those arrangements around the number of patients within a ward uh, and so on. So again, various strands to this. Yeah, OK. And then, so after, after that, April visit, there's a, pe a period of months um, until we get to November of that year uh, when, we, when it's escalated to um, stage four. Um, and obviously it's gone to that stage because there's been a lack of progress. Do we know why there was a lack of progress? So you're right. The, so what the Scottish Government effectively have said and, and in, indeed the, their, the letter from the Director General to the convener and myself Know, uh, setting out that the Scottish Government weren't satisfied that the leadership within the board was 
taking sufficient steps to address the concerns raised by his, the oversight group, uh, and then subsequently, uh, just very short time later, by NHS Education for Scotland. And I think, as we've probably set out in the report and, and uh, discussed uh, to some extent this morning, leadership, governance, cultural issues um, were of such significance. The Scottish Government wasn't satisfied that the Board was making progress against the findings and recommendations of these regulatory bodies. So, ultimately, it, are, we, are we to pin the blame for these issues on, on that leadership problem, the Chief Exec, who's now gone, and the Board? Were they not doing their jobs properly? So it's difficult to reach a, a very specific um, source, Mr Simpson, on responsibility. Um, health boards structurally they have an executive leadership team. They have wider boards of governance. They have very close relationships with the Scottish Government, with their regulatory bodies. But we do have an accountable officer system um, of uh, within the Scottish public sector, and that you know involves personal responsibility. Clearly, we've, as we've said in the report, there's been a change of executive leadership within the board that they will, and due to recruit permanently for a new post holder uh, within the, the next uh, month or so. We understand, um, but again, it isn't just about effective executive leadership deficiencies that there were, indeed, you know, set out in, in John Brown's report, but also deficiencies or governance not operating as effectively as it needed to. So the governance yeah. light model that we talked about through COVID, not moving back to a pace that it needed to, especially with the concerns that are evident in, in the report. So I think a pace, an element of timing, culture and pace to have the necessary arrangements in place. But that whole, that whole, you know, leadership, it comes from the chief exec and it comes from the board. So to have got itself into the position where it's, a, where we have to escalate it to stage four, because there have been a whole series of problems, which I'll come on to, that, that surely Surely we have to say, well, the chief exec wasn't doing the job and the board wasn't doing their job properly. Surely it's fair to say that. So I think the facts are laid out in the, in the various inspectors' reports that, and there's a, that there is a consistency of finding around governance and leadership that suggests that there are issues to be addressed. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's pretty plain to, to see, Mr yeah. Simpson, yeah. You know, that there were concerns around the... the uh, the factors that you address, you're uh, referring to. Yeah, it is plain to see. Um, I want to just ask you um, about something uh, which is very concerning. Um, it's on page 10 um, of the report. Uh, it's actually contained in that timeline. Um, HIS's inspectors identified instances of unsafe practice around medicines governance which could result in serious harm to patients. Do you have any more details of what that, you know, what that means? What lay behind that? Um, so these are set out in, the, in aspects in our report, but in more detail in, in the, his report. Lee might want to say a bit more about uh, the circumstances. Um, I think we would just support your judgment on it, Mr. Simpson, that if we're in the realms of potential patient harm through unsafe use of medicines um, and the factors around, uh, as we talk about in the report, about you know, staff levels, skill mix, experience of NHS workers uh, applying medicines, and then concerns not being listened to, I think it's also set out in, in the report and not being supported or listened to effectively by senior management, paint a picture of, uh, of one of real risk to, to patient safety. Um, that has identified that as evidence that 
the different part of the system is working as intended. You know, so we, we have inspectors and regulators for a reason. They did their job, they raised concerns, and they escalated it when they weren't satisfied that appropriate steps were being taken. I'll pause. Lee might want to say a bit more. I don't have any more detail to give about, about that, the governance of the medicines. That it would be within the, the HES report. Um, but I think as, as it, what follows that, I guess, would give you an indication is just about um, the kind of oversight, the senior management oversight, the more senior oversight um, of staff, I, I'm sure, is, is feeding into that. But for the very specific detail, you would need to look at the Healthcare Improvement Scotland full report. OK. But presumably, the, these unsafe practices have now ended, whatever they were. So I th think hopefully you'll uh, appreciate, Mr Simpson, I'm, I'm not able to give you that assurance, yeah, that's fine. actually, that it's something that... Um, NHS Fourth Valley, validated by their inspectors, would be able to uh, give assurance to the committee on. Okay. Um, you do say that the board has responded, uh, your, in your word, positively to the escalation framework. So, what, what do you mean by positively? So I think that's fair. What we've seen is that there's been an acceptance by the board of the the various factors that caused them to be escalated and the resultant steps that they've taken. So I think we're now on the third version of the improvement plan, the escalation improvement plan, and you know, underpinned by themes that we set out at paragraph 26 of the report of the NHS Four Valley's ambitions to put patients first, support their staff and work in partnership, and then re referencing back to the discussion with Mr Coffey, that the assurance arrangements, the governance around this um, is, is in the right place in overall terms. What the Scottish Government through the Assurance Board and the Health Board themselves will want to see very clearly though is that for the wide range of recommendations is that they have the evidence to support uh, that they've met the recommendation, they've got progress, which ultimately for this Health Board will lead them to be de-escalated by the Scottish Government. I think our judgment is one of acceptance, progress and overall arrangements. But the next step really matters, Mr Simpson, that yeah. they've got the evidence uh, across the piece to show that they are making progress. So a way to go yet. And how, do, and, and how do we measure whether they actually have made progress? We're not just going to take their word for it, are we? And some of it's going to be harder than other bits as well. So, you know, you, the example you've uh, asked about, about safe prescribing, I think, you know, you can, his will be able to satisfy themselves through their procedures that they've addressed that style of recommendation. Other bits are going to be harder, though. You know, culture, for example, isn't going to be resolved overnight, and that will take a programme of activity, reconciliation, perhaps, between members of staff and leaders within NHS Fourth Valley. Governance is also going to take investment too. Um, effective working across the executive leadership team. These will be judgments that, and as Pat's mentioned, that he and his colleagues will, will track progress through the annual audit. As I conclude in, in my own report today, that I'll take a view um, during the course of 2024 the extent to which further public reporting will take place on NHS Fourth Valley. Mm -hmm. but, there's good, but there's a range of aspects to this. Evidence matters. And this is the kind of principle of the, the measurement framework that the board, the Assurance Board of the Scottish Government, are clear when mm -hmm. effectively say that one's done and we've got more to work to do on this one. OK. Um, you mentioned in your report that NHS Fourth Valley is about to embark on what's called a culture change and compassionate leadership program um, which is apparently used uh, elsewhere so i've got no idea what that what that means can you explain what that is probably not to any great degree mr simpson but um i think if we draw on um nhs highland for example and there's it's not a perfect analogy but you can see that there are models that exist and have been used elsewhere in uh, NHS, um, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, uh, to reset relationships. 
fundamentally what we're talking about between uh, staff, leaders, uh, and governance within an organisation. Um, it's, it's very, um, it shouldn't be underestimated the scale of challenge that's going to be required here. You know, culture, as there are many you know, management cliches that can be set out, can dominate an organisation. And once a change of culture is, is being put in place, again, it's going to require considerable investment to reset that supports NHS Fort Valley's mission. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned a moment or two, and I think, again, important to, to, to put out that the priorities of this health board through the Escalation Improvement Plan are about putting patients first, supporting their staff, and working in partnership. Um, culture will be at the heart of that programme. The detail of, of uh, how they intend to address that, I think, will be multifaceted. And for NHS Fort Valley, I think, I'm sure we'd be able to provide the committee with the range of steps that they're taking. Well, I guess so. I guess we'll have to ask them because I don't know what what's wrong with the culture um, and what needs to needs but, to change. Well, maybe just to, just to highlight, I, I think it's, it's in a couple of places from various inspectors' report, staff felt they weren't being listened to. Yeah. That's a huge, significant aspect of culture. The staff need to be able in any organisation that they're respected that their voice is heard and that management listened to them. It's clear that some members of NHS Fourth Valley felt that the culture wasn't effective for that to happen. Okay, I've just got one final question that goes, it has been asked, it's been covered before. Um, when we talk about the financial su sustainability um, and you say in your report there's a risk the board is not financially sustainable in the short term and Rebecca you've 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 talked about that as well I just want to understand what happens if that continues if you know if the board remains financially unsustainable what actually what actually happens do we escalate it even so, further so I'm, going to, I'm going to ask Lee just to set out for the committee what happens because uh, arrangements have changed a couple of times uh, over a number of years. So uh, committee may recall that previously you had brokerage arrangements that you know if you didn't meet your financial target, effectively you got a loan from the Scottish Government that was called brokerage. Uh, those arrangements changed and you know, I think COVID or just before these amounts were of previous debt was written off and you can kind of, and there's a reset and then we moved into uh, kind of a, a slightly longer term planning horizon, medium term financial plans. Where we are now, again, I think I'm going to bring Lee in just to set out, and bear in mind this is a real life example here. So as Pat set out, there's about a £10 million gap or yeah. so. That may or may not be bridged, but if it doesn't, here is the Scottish Government offers support and Lee can kind of uh, take us through that. I guess post-pandemic, so during the pandemic, boards were fully funded, obviously, um, and now that we've moved out of the pandemic, there, it, it's gone back to arrangements that were brought in, um, I guess, in 2018. So uh, boards have a 1% flexibility, um, so they can, um, they can be in deficit 1%, but they have to break even within three years. Other than that, they will seek uh, additional financial support from Scottish Government, essentially uh, brokerage, a return to uh, receiving brokerage. What would, what would happen if the government turned around and said, no, you're not getting it? So in a, in a hypothetical situation like that, the NHS boards would report an in-year deficit. Uh, from an audit perspective, that would be, uh, well, I'll not speak for Pat, but he would have to give consideration to uh, the regularity of that spending because there isn't budget cover or approval for the board to produce uh, an unbalanced budget. So, uh, and therefore, that would again bring my attention and a potentially a, a statutory report. Um, I think services would continue and it would be a call for the Scottish Government what it wanted to do next and how it would look to support the board escalation frameworks exist, a review of its service provision arrangements, 
and how it would then help the board to return to financial balance. So a range of tools available uh, for the Scottish Government, primarily Mr Simpson, and undoubtedly decisions for the board itself. Well, yeah, really, really interesting. I mean, it's reminding me, uh, convener, of uh, the work we've been doing on colleges. I mean, we, we, we've heard there are a number of them in si similar position uh, may have to be bailed out, which sounds like, you know, that could be the case here. So, again, we'll, we're closely tracking, as, as Pat and his colleagues are, through the audit of NHS 4 Valley across the piece. But, as we've said a number of times today, that the financial challenges are clear for NHS boards in Scotland to deliver uh, financial balance in year and in years into the future for all the reasons that we try and cover in the report um, of the extent of demand, cost pressures, inflationary pressures um, and you know, enacting the routes through to transformative change that will deliver sustainable uh, health services in Scotland. Thanks. Thanks for the OK, thank you. Um, we are drawing towards a close. I've just got a couple of quick uh, questions for you. Uh, so, Auditor General, you mentioned the importance of staff being listened to, and you referred, for example, to whistleblowing. Uh, but it's the case, isn't it, that um, staff being listened to isn't just about individual whistleblowers using public interest disclosure. It's also about routine collective uh, listening to trade unions, uh, for example, in the forums of health and safety, as well as partnership working. Um, the committee may be aware that there is a unique aspect of NHS governance with the presence of an employee director um, on the board of health boards that underpins the importance of the relationship um, and listening to staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, my second uh, quick question is uh, one which we've um, addressed in a number of other uh, reports, and that is the question of induction training for members of the health board. Do they get that in Forth Valley? Um, so I'm not sure we've covered that in our audit work, convener. I'd be very surprised if that wasn't the case. I think it's almost certain that there is a programme of support and induction for all public appointees um, in Scotland. In fact, to correct myself, I know that there is. Uh, and indeed, Audit Scotland itself has played a role in uh, providing... Um, induction materials, we've given presentations to public appointments, including health board uh, directors, as part of a, a wider programme of activity. So, so yes, there is a programme of induction convener. Um, so that's not an issue you've identified or was identified by the John Brown uh, inquiry? I think, look at the specifics of, of John Brown's report, but I think what he has found that regardless of the quality of induction, um, it's not a safe... Uh, a, a, an entirely uh, sufficient safeguard to make sure that there's effective governance in place, as can happen on any board, whether it's public sector or private sector. You can have all the effective governance uh, induction arrangements you like. That doesn't guarantee that there will be effective decision making throughout the lifetime of somebody's presence on the board. Pat may want to, to say a bit more about the specifics of Fourth Valley. I, I know uh, John Brown raised in his report um, issues regarding board challenge and board scrutiny, which is obviously a key element of governance, um, convener. And I, 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 that is another one of the recommendations, and I think that will be reflected in the induction training going forward for board members. Um, that level of challenge scrutiny um, that is, is absolutely essential, because uh, I think there were some deficiencies there in the past. I think... That's fine, I would say, convener, but it's not in itself going to guarantee effective governance, uh, cultural, effective leadership. This, this has to be constantly worked at. You know, so the examples that his and other regulators have found would have all been within the confines of effective governance, but yet they still happened. So it's, the board has to constantly assure and check itself, as all health boards do, that governance is robust enough to deal with challenging scenarios. Yeah, and I think one of the um, lessons we've learned is that culture change is one thing. It's keeping the culture change going that's probably the, the harder task. My final uh, question to you is, and you alluded to this, I think, in answering some of Graeme Simpson's questions about 
how far it is to go um, uh, through the assurance board process and so on. I mean, again, um, when I um, had a briefing from the assurance board, which I think it was as far back as May of last year, uh, the expression they used was uh, that they thought there was a long way to go at that stage. Now we're several months down the line, and so that might have, position might have been revised. But at that time they were saying, and I took a note of it, that there was no clear path to de-escalation. What's your assessment today of that? So somewhat reluctant to speak for the Assurance Board convener. I think they'll be better placed to assess uh, their intentions than I am. Um, I'm sure the Assurance Board will want to be satisfied that there's clear evidence of progress in meeting the, the quite significant range of recommendations, as we've heard a number of times, another 50 from, uh, on governance from John Brown. Culture, which will take a period of time to evidence progress on too. Um, so I think at the moment, um, for us, it's a wait and see and close engagement through the, our audit activity on progress. But the, the timeline is probably one for the Assurance Board themselves to, to speak to. Yeah. I just wonder, though, based on your experience, I mean, I was quite taken aback uh, when they uh, said to me and other re uh, elected representatives who were taking part in that discussion that it was going to be, it could be years before de-escalation takes place. I mean, is, is that a sense that you get? Is that the experience that we've had in the case of other health boards that have been escalated to level four? We've, we've not seen that uh, length of timeline in terms of years. Um, that being the case, I think it probably illustrates to committee and those engaged in today's session that the scale of issues here are significant. They require very careful attention, focus, all of the actions and evidence um, of progress. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and we know that to be the case, that the Assurance Board are focused on these, to be satisfied that the evidence framework is robust and they can see progress being made. Um, but again, I, I'm probably just not in a position, convener, to say uh, whether it's going to be months or years. OK, thank you. Well, look, on that note, uh, can I draw uh, this morning's evidence session uh, to a close? Uh, can I thank Auditor General Yu for the evidence that you've given us uh, and uh, from Pat Kenny from Deloitte, Rebecca McConaughey from Deloitte and Lee Johnson from Audit Scotland. Thank you all for uh, the evidence that you've uh, shared with us this morning. Uh, I am now going to draw this morning's uh, session to a close in public and move the committee into private session. Thank you.